Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. We continue our tour of the cities of the ancient world. This time we're heading back to the ancient East. But first we're going to stop along the way in Venice. Venice in the early 1800s. To visit with an Englishman for a while. Today's Venice is one of the most expensive cities in the world, with its ancient landmarks scrupulously restored for the benefit of tourists and their cell phone cameras. But in 1816, it was a city that had obviously seen better days. The Republic of Venice had come to an end in the Napoleonic Wars 19 years earlier, and Venice had been kicked around like a football in those wars until Napoleon was defeated in 1814 after which it was part of the Austrian Empire. On the one hand, Venice was not rich anymore. On the other, it was full of decaying monuments of a glorious past when it had controlled practically the whole Mediterranean. It was just the sort of place to attract English travelers infected with the Romantic movement in poetry and art, and it was full of aristocratic palaces that they could rent for very little money. It was just the place for the romantic poet Lord Byron, who could no longer live in England because of the creditors who wanted to put him in prison and the husbands who wanted to kill him. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know was how one of his many romantic conquests described him, but Byron was a brilliant poet and had a remarkably adaptable mind. He was always looking for something new to relieve his boredom, and in Venice, he heard of the curious island monastery of St. Lazarus of the Armenians. It was a tiny island about a mile out into the water where Armenian Catholic monks lived. Armenians? In Venice? Already it sounded mysterious and romantic. But when Byron visited and got to know the monks, he was suddenly obsessed with Armenia. He wrote to a poet friend, I am studying daily at an Armenian monastery, the Armenian language. I found that my mind wanted something craggy to break upon, and this, as the most difficult thing I could discover here for an amusement, I have chosen to torture me into attention. Byron did more than study the language. He helped one of the monks publish an Armenian and English grammar. He translated Armenian literature and translated some of his own poems into Armenian. All this was in spite of the fact that Armenian was not an easy language for Western Europeans to pick up casually. In fact, I feel the need to apologize right now for my attempts at pronunciation throughout this podcast. Byron told his friend that four years before, the French instituted an Armenian professorship. Twenty pupils presented themselves on Monday morning, full of noble ardor, ingenuous youth, and impregnable industry. They persevered with a courage worthy of the nation and of universal conquest till Thursday, when fifteen of the twenty succumbed to the sixth and twentieth letter of the alphabet. It is, to be sure, a Waterloo of an alphabet. That must be said for them. The twenty-sixth letter was only two-thirds of the way through. The Armenian alphabet has thirty-eight letters. A Waterloo of an alphabet indeed. Why was Byron suddenly so obsessed with Armenian? What captured his notoriously flighty mind and made him take lessons from monks, though Byron was certainly not known for his religious enthusiasm? It seemed to Byron that he had stumbled on a lost civilization, a whole continent of literature to explore that no one had ever told him about before. Here's what he said. There are some very curious manuscripts in the monastery, as well as books, translations also from Greek originals now lost, and from Persian and Syriac, etc., besides works of their own people. And that vast continent is still lost today for most of us. 
Specialists know that there is a vast classical Armenian literature, much of it still waiting to be explored by Westerners. But most of the rest of us never think about Armenia. Most of us are shocked to find out that Armenia was the first Christian country on earth. And this finally brings us to our famous ancient city that most Americans have never heard of, Echmetsin, also known as Vakarshapat, a city that for almost its whole existence has had two names. Armenia is a country that has always been stuck between empires. In the early Christian era, the empires were Rome and Parthia, whose constant bickering over their long-shared border made Armenia strategically important. Most of the history of Armenia for the first 300 years of the Christian era is the story of how Rome and Parthia fought for domination. Oddly, the Arsacid dynasty, which at least nominally ruled Armenia throughout that time, was a Parthian noble family, but had been installed as rulers by the Romans. In the year 258, King Khosros II was assassinated by a Parthian named Anak, instigated by the Persian emperor, the Persians having replaced the Parthians as rulers of the empire to the east. In a furious rage, the Armenian nobles murdered Anak and his entire family, all but his baby son Gregory, who was whisked away to Cappadocia in the Roman Empire. Khosros had only one heir, and he too was a baby, Tiridates, the third king of that name. With an infant king, nothing could prevent the Persians from taking over Armenia. Just in time, Tiridates too was whisked out of Armenia. He ended up in the city of Rome. Two children orphaned at the same time, one the son of the assassin, the other the son of his victim. If we were writing a historical novel, we might be tempted to give them intertwined destinies. But then we'd say, nah, that's too implausible. Nobody would believe it. History, however, is not limited by dramatic plausibility. If history wants to tie these children's destinies in knots, then that's what history will do. Tiridates, the son of the king, was raised in Rome with every possible advantage. After all, he might be useful. Give the Romans half a chance, and they would try to kick the Persians out of Armenia. And they had the legitimate king right here, ready to take his throne back if he had some help. So Tiridates had the best possible education, and he grew up multilingual and was well-versed in Roman military science. Meanwhile, Gregory, the son of the assassin, was also getting an education. But it was a different kind of education. He ended up in a Cappadocian family of Christians, so he was brought up as a Christian. Gregory would go on to become such an important character in history that we don't know much about him. We have stories galore, and many of them may be true, but he was the kind of go-getter saint whose life accumulates legends. We'll hear the stories, as the Armenians have always told them, and then we'll try to sort out what we really know. The Romans had found their opportunity, and Tiridates, the exiled king, was back on the throne as a loyal Roman ally. He brought with him a talented Armenian who, like him, had been raised in the Roman Empire and gave him an important government position. But this other young Armenian turned out to be trouble for Tiridates. When Tiridates ordered him to worship a statue of the local goddess, Anahit, this young man refused. You've served me loyally for years, said Tiridates. Why do you refuse this one thing now? I've served you as God tells us to serve our earthly masters, the man explained, but I can worship only God. He told Tiridates to give up his stubborn attachment to mere images and worship the true God. Tiridates was furious. You've insulted me and the gods, he said. He had the man thrown into prison and tortured. Then, at just the right dramatic moment, one of the other men of the court recognized that this Christian was none other than Gregory, son of the man who had assassinated Tiridates' father. That did not make Tiridates any less angry. According to the story, he threw Gregory into a deep pit and left him there for 13 years, others say 15, and had him tortured the whole time. 
Meanwhile, back in the Roman Empire, the Emperor Diocletian was looking for a wife. He hired a bunch of portrait painters to go all through the empire to find the most beautiful women and paint their portraits, so that Diocletian could look through them and pick out a wife for himself. It turned out that the most beautiful woman in the whole empire was a Christian nun. Diocletian immediately started his great persecution of the Christian churches in order to show her that she had better marry him. The intended bride and her sister nuns decided to run far away, and they ended up in Etchmitzin. But the king there was a loyal ally of Diocletian. When Diocletian sent to get his bride back, Tiridates found out how beautiful she was, and he fell for her too. He tried to seduce her, but nothing he could do would prevail. The furious king had her killed, along with the other nuns and many other Christians. This was such a wicked deed that the next time Tiridates went out hunting, he suddenly went mad and fell from his chariot. Some versions of the story say he turned into a boar. Thus he learned the lesson every Catholic bishop knows by heart. You don't mess with nuns. The king's sister, however, started having visions. They told her that only the Christian, Gregory, could put the king back in his right mind. And so it happened. Gregory was brought up out of the pit, still miraculously alive after all these years, and he cured the king's madness and his boorishness. With such a powerful demonstration of the mercy of God, Tiridates was convinced and became a Christian, and all his people with him. That's the story. Most modern historians would say it's heavily embroidered with legend. They don't believe the part about the king turning into a boar, for example. But strip away all the legend, and the facts are still amazing. Tiridates and Gregory are real historical figures, and somehow Tiridates was converted to Christianity by Gregory. They call him Gregory the Illuminator, the Apostle of Armenia. Since it happened before Rome became officially Christian, Armenia has the honor of being the first Christian nation on earth. It also has the honor of having what is probably the oldest Christian cathedral on earth. Etchmetzin Cathedral was originally built under King Tiridates III in the early 300s. Most of it was destroyed by a Persian invasion in the late 400s, but it was rebuilt, and since then has been gradually expanded and adorned, but never replaced. Today it is still the seat of the Armenian Apostolic Church. So the king was a Christian and his capital had a fine cathedral all before the Roman Empire had become officially Christian. But there was a difficulty. What do you do if your country is committed to Christianity, but all the Christian literature is in a language most people who live there don't understand? Well, you translate it. But in order to have a literature at all, you first have to be able to write. And although there are some indications that Armenian had already been written down in some way, Armenia didn't really have a literate culture. It was up to Armenia's next great cultural hero, St. Mesrop Mashtots, to make Armenian literacy possible. Mesrop was a well-educated nobleman who was the official secretary of the king. In those days, about the year 400, Armenian royal business was written down in Greek and Persian, the languages of the two bordering empires. When Armenian had to be written at all, it seems people borrowed one of the other writing systems, Greek or Persian or even Syriac, and tried to make the letters fit the sounds of their language. But their language had more sounds than there were letters in any of those alphabets. After some years in court, Mesrop felt called to an ascetic life. He left the court, took holy orders, and went into a monastery. But after a few years of that, he came back out into public life again, this time as an evangelist. As he traveled the country making converts of the remaining pagans, he felt more and more the need to be able to record Christian truth in writing in a language the people could understand. So, with the help of some other intellectual types, Both in Armenia and abroad, he created an alphabet that would represent all the sounds of the Armenian language. His alphabet had 36 letters. Two more came in during the Middle Ages, making the 38 that Byron had to learn. Once Armenian had an alphabet, 
the Armenian monks immediately set to translating all the important Christian literature into Armenian. First came the Holy Scriptures, of course. After that, the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils were translated, and the liturgy. The Armenians had been using the Syriac liturgy until that time. But they didn't stop with the basics. Mesrop sent Armenian monks to the great cities of the Greek-speaking Eastern Roman Empire to study Greek and to bring back translations of as many good books as they could get their hands on. For specialists in early Christianity, this makes a knowledge of Armenian essential. Once Lord Byron opened the floodgates, Western Europeans started to discover that countless important works thought to have been lost were still preserved in Armenian translations. Because of the tireless Armenian translators, we have added many previously lost works back into the canon of the Church Fathers. Over and over, as we go through the list of their writings, we come across the same kind of statement. The Greek original of this book has been lost, but it's preserved in an Armenian translation. The Armenian church separated from the Catholic and Orthodox churches, along with many of the Eastern churches that Westerners have traditionally called monophysite, meaning that they believe that Christ has one nature that is both divine and human, as opposed to the Catholic doctrine that the divine and human natures are distinct and unconfused, but united in the one indivisible Son of God. These churches usually prefer to be called miophysite, one nature. Armenian literature had its ups and downs, but Armenian art and writing flourished in the Middle Ages and has continued straight through to the present. In the 1500s, Armenia was conquered by the Persians, and many Armenian intellectuals left for Western Europe, just as the age of printing began. They brought their books with them and set up Armenian presses in Europe. Most Western Europeans ignored them, but they were preserving Armenian literature at a critical time. A large number of Armenians once lived in what is today's Turkey under the Ottoman Empire, but during the First World War and the wars that followed the collapse of the Ottoman government, somewhere around a million of them were massacred. The Armenian genocide is often the only thing the average American history student knows about Armenians. Today, only about 100,000 Armenians live in Turkey but they still make up the largest single group of Christians. Today, Armenia is an independent nation again since the fall of the Soviet Union. Its border with Turkey, just a few miles away from Echmetsin, is closed. Turkey has always officially denied the Armenian genocide and aggressively threatens institutions that mount exhibits or publish histories dealing with it. But in 1999... Turkey dedicated a towering memorial to the martyred Turks massacred by Armenians. No, I did not say that backwards. It's the tallest monument in Turkey. As for the city of Echmetsin, it's become a suburb of the current capital, Yerevan. But for Armenian Christians, holy Echmetsin is still the spiritual capital of the Armenian Apostolic Church. In 1996, the Armenian Apostolic Church and the Catholic Church together took a great step toward reconciliation. When Pope John Paul II and the Supreme Patriarch Karakin I made a common declaration, they welcomed, they said, the great advance that their churches have registered in their common search for unity in Christ, the Word of God made flesh. Perfect God as to his divinity, perfect man as to his humanity. His divinity is united to his humanity in the person of the only begotten Son of God, in a union which is real, perfect, without confusion, without alteration, without division, without any form of separation. That's progress. And if you visit St. Peter's Basilica in Rome today, you'll see a monumental statue of St. Gregory the Illuminator, imposing at almost 20 feet tall and weighing more than 26 tons. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Way of the Fathers, and if you did, I ask you to consider making a donation to help us. We are entirely listener-funded, and so we're utterly dependent on you. So please go now to our form at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Send us your gift and let us know that you love the Fathers. And remember, we pray for our listeners and benefactors every day. 
De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant filium dei. Way of the Fathers is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.